just to be reminded of where we've been in chapter 8, we started with that chapter back around October 29th. And as we've come through this chapter, my mic is not on, I can tell. Is that better? Yes. Okay, good. So, again, Luke 8, 40 through 56, as we've talked about this, this chapter over the last, there it is, over the last month, what Martin has brought to us, especially in the first 21 verses of that chapter, is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the gospel, is coming in both word and koinonia. And then we went through some of the parables where we saw that the family of God is going to be comprised of people who hear the word, do the word, and actually bear much fruit. And then in the last few weeks, as we've been talking about the power and authority of Jesus, we've seen his authority and power over demons. We saw that last week. The previous week, we saw his power and authority over nature as he calmed the storm. And then today, as we get into these verses, we're going to see the power and authority of Jesus over death and disease. And so, before we read these verses, I would like to pray. So if you would, bow your heads and let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you this morning. And we ask that you would prepare us for the reading of your word. We ask that you would give us ears to hear and a mind to understand that we would be transformed by your word. Speak now, for we, your servants, are listening. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is Luke 8, verses 40 through 56. It's actually on page 866 of your pew Bible, if you would like to use that. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people, why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed. But she charged them to tell no one what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of our God stands forever. If you were to look throughout history. And you were to take a look at just a few tragic events that have occurred over just, say, the last 25 years. Two of those events that you would probably pick out would be 9-11 and then Hurricane Katrina are just two that come to mind. If you were to go online to the Pew Research Group, you would see that studies after study have been done 
and they've looked at the faith life and how active it was after these events occurred. For those of us who have experienced either watching those things on TV or have loved ones have actually been involved in those events, you, it's, no, it's no surprise to you that a lot of people reported that after 9-11 and after Hurricane Katrina, attendance at worship services went up. Regular prayer, regular time with the Lord went up. Prayer became more frequent. Why is that? It's because when we experience those difficult times, when we experience those tragic times, the first place we want to turn to is our God. And so I don't know, I don't know what difficult circumstances you're facing right now. When you walked into these doors today, I don't know what circumstances you left. I don't know what circumstances you will face in the next day or the next weeks to come. But what I do know is this. You and I serve a God who is sovereign and in control of every detail of our lives. And because of that fact, we can know that he will use the difficult circumstances of our lives to draw us closer to him and lead us into genuine saving faith. But what does that look like? What does genuine, save, genuine saving faith involve? Well, it involves four things. And I apologize for your notes because your notes have three, and that was my fault. But there's four, actually, and it is on the screen. Genuine saving faith involves, one, coming to Jesus. Two, it involves acknowledging our greatest need. Three, trusting in Christ alone through faith. And four, living out the new life that we've been given. So we're going to take number one, come to Jesus. Genuine saving faith first involves us coming to Jesus. And you see that in the verses that we just read. Verses 40 through 42, you have a ruler of the synagogue. It means he had official duties in the synagogue. It also means that he had some level of wealth, an influential position, and he had some means to try to figure out, how do I heal my daughter? My 12-year-old daughter is dying. How do I heal her? But obviously nothing had worked for him because he comes to Jesus, and he comes begging Jesus, please come to my house. And we know from this same account in Mark 5, the reason he wants Jesus to come to his house is to lay his hands upon his daughter so that she'll be completely healed. And Jesus begins to go, and as he does, the woman comes on the scene. The, what the woman is doing is she's, she's in the crowd, and she's sneaking up behind Jesus. And she's sneaking up behind Jesus because we know that in Mark 5, we hear what her thoughts are. And her thoughts are this, if I can just touch the fringe of his garment, I know I will be healed. And so she approaches Jesus, and she's coming from behind, but what, why does she need to be healed? She has a discharge of blood that she has had to deal with for 12 years. 12 years. As long as that little girl has been alive, she has been with this sickness, with this discharge that leaves her, it leaves her anemic. It leaves her with so many medical conditions that she's gone from physician to physician to physician, but yet there's no cure. And we know she's been to all these doctors because it says that she spent all of her money on these doctors. And if you look at Mark 5, you'll learn that she's gone to all these doctors and whatever the doctors prescribed actually made her condition worse. So what we look at with these two individuals are two very different situations. But when we answer the, G, the, the question of who can come to Jesus, here is the answer that we see in, two of the, in, in these two people. When, when this woman comes before Jesus in verse 49, she comes fearfully, she comes trembling. 
And Jesus has a conversation with her, but here's what Jesus does not do. This got really loud in here. Here's what Jesus does not do. Jesus does not look at this woman and say, you know what? You are ceremonially unclean. Because again, we know in Leviticus 25 that a woman with this type of discharge cannot participate in the worship services in the temple. And she's deemed unclean, which means anyone she touches or anyone who touches her, that person becomes unclean as well. So she's an outcast. So what this says about who can come to Jesus is this. Jesus does not look at this woman and say, hey, you know what? I want you to clean up your life before you come to me. I want you to get your life straight, your finances in order, and, and everything in perfect order. Then you can come to me. Jesus does not do that. He allows a woman to come to him who has no health, no wealth, no resources, no influence in the community, nothing. And he does not turn her away. That's who can come. That invitation is open. But then we see how, how do we come. And we look at both of the ruler of the synagogue and the woman. And you're, you see in those verses that they come humbly, they come reverently, and they come by faith. Humbly and reverently meaning this. That word for they fell down before the feet of Jesus actually means to prostrate oneself. It means to, to put themselves in a physical position where they are honoring that person in front of them. The same type of verb is used in Mark 3 when the unclean spirits fell before Christ and said, you are the Son of God. The same type of verb is used in Luke 5, 8 when Peter falls down before Jesus and says, depart from me for I'm a sinner. In these accounts, we see person after person after person who it, they're prostrating themselves before the Lord and they're saying, you have the power and authority to, to take these circumstances and remove them from my life. I do not. They come humbly, they come reverently, but then they come by faith. And I'm just going to point you to one verse to, to, to explain what I mean by that. John 6, says this, No one can come to me, this is Jesus speaking, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In other words, no one can come to Jesus unless the Father who sent Jesus draws him. And what that means, that word draw means to compel. So for you and me, what that means is for, for the people in this, in this story, for the woman and for the ruler of the synagogue, what that means is even their desire to come to Jesus is the work of God's saving, sorry, God's saving grace. Even their desire to come. Yes, they made a decision to come to Jesus, but even their desire to come is a work of God's saving grace because no one comes unless they're drawn by the Father. And so we come to Jesus because of the initiating work of God. There's a man by the name of William T. Sleeper who wrote a hymn called Jesus, I Come. I'm just going to read a, a couple of verses out of that, out of that hymn says this, out of my sickness into thy health, out of my want and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Out of earth's sorrow and into thy balm, out of life's storm and into thy calm, Jesus, I come to thee. See, Jesus is inviting you today. Jesus Christ, our Savior, is inviting you today to come. To come to him. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. And that invitation is an invitation for us to come out of religious performance, to come out of legalism, and to trust the true living God in a relationship. 
That's the first part of genuine saving faith. We must come to Jesus humbly, reverently, by faith. And the next thing is we come and we acknowledge our greatest need. So, in our passage, this woman and this man, we've already talked about their physical needs. We've talked about the man and his, and his daughter who's dying, but we've also talked about the woman and the fact that she has this discharge. And Luke, in, in verse 43, says that no one was able to heal her. No one could do it. And the Greek phrase that's in there is, it, it means that no one, there's not one person who had the power enough to heal her. She was completely incapable of being made clean. Completely incapable of healing herself. And so what that does is that actually presents not just a physical need, but a spiritual need. Because of the fact that she was not able to participate in worship services, she's not able to go to the place where she gets to experience the presence of God. She was completely incapable of making herself clean to, to be able to worship. You and I have something in common with this woman. You and I are completely incapable of saving ourselves from our sin. You and I have a sin disease that is in our hearts that apart from Christ, we have absolutely no ability to save ourselves from. That sin disease was passed from our parents, Adam and Eve. And Paul, in Romans 3.23, says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But earlier in that text, he says this, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. We all have this sin disease in our hearts that we are completely incapable of removing. We are completely incapable of doing any spiritual good that would lead us unto salvation. There's a book called Follow Me by David Platt. He writes about what it means to be a follower of Christ, and he says this about our, our greatest need. Our problem is not simply that we have made some bad decisions. Our problem is not that we've messed up. Our problem is that at the very core of our being, we are rebels against God and are completely unable, unable to trust in him by faith. This is our greatest need. If you have stood up here and become a member of this church, there is a vow that you have taken, and it goes like this. It says, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God without hope for your salvation except in his sovereign mercy? In other words, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ? That is a, a vow that many of you have stood, have had read out to you, and you have agreed with that. And so we have, to add, we have to answer that question now. Do you acknowledge that you have this need for your sin to be removed? And that need can't be satisfied with money. It can't be satisfied with influence, reputation, religious activity, or just an accumulation of good deeds. We must acknowledge that our greatest need is that we are sinners in need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so we come to Jesus and we acknowledge that need, but then we move into trusting Christ. And therefore, we must trust Christ alone through faith. Going back to our passage, this woman is coming up behind Jesus in secret. She touches the fringe of his garment and she is healed. But Jesus, having felt power come out from him, knows that someone has been healed, and he says, who was it that touched me? Who was it that touched me? And the woman realizes, even though she came in secret, she can't slip away in secret. And so she has to turn around and face Jesus. And when she does, she comes trembling and falling down on her knees. She comes humbly, and she comes reverently, and she begins to tell her story, why she needed to be healed, 
And what happened when she touched that garment? Why she need to be healed and, and what happened? There's one thing I want to bring up on the, just in the Greek that's used in this text. It's so very important because, again, you have these words that Jesus is about to speak over her because he turns to her after she tells her story and he says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. But then later in the story, we have this ruler of the synagogue whose daughter was dying, but because of this delay with the woman, her, his daughter has died. And Jesus overhears the story that his daughter has died, and he looks at, he looks at this, this father, and he says, Do not fear, only believe. She will be made well. In those two verbs that are, at, that, are, that are going on, when Jesus speaks, when it describes them being made well or them being healed, it's a word that means both to heal and to save. It's a word that means both to heal and to save. And the reason Jesus is using that word is because he's not just interested in healing our physical ailments. He's interested in healing the whole person. He's interested in healing the sin disease that encompasses our hearts that no man or woman has the power or authority to cleanse but him alone. That's it. That's what he's interested in. But one other thing, when he says to that dad, do not fear, only believe, that verb for only believe actually means keep believing. And what he's saying to that man is, is this. I know that your daughter is dead. I know you think this is the end. I know that you're having a difficult time with this. I know you're hurting. I know that you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I'm here to tell you, keep believing in me. Keep trusting in the one who has the power and authority over death and disease. So many of you know, Dylan and I have four children, and we have, we have, they're all adults now, but at one point, they were not. And, um, and so we have had our times of struggling to, to deal with certain situations where we have absolutely no control over our children. There's, they, they, there's certain situations that they've gotten into in the past, and we have had no ability no resources that we could come up with would have changed their circumstances. And it was in that time that we had to keep believing, keep trusting Christ. And it was during that time that we would draw closer to him, that we would be closer to each other. And actually, in a few situations, our children would return to God and be closer to him. Genuine saving faith involves trusting in Christ alone by faith. But this last point that I want you to hear is we must live out the new life that we've been given. We come to Jesus, we acknowledge our need, we trust in Christ alone through faith alone, and now we live out the new life that we've been given. That Jesus says to this, to this woman, he calls her his daughter. And I want you to realize the importance of this. This is the first time in this text that this woman has been referred to other than her gender and her medical condition. He looks at her and he calls her his daughter. And the significance of that, the significance of that is huge. Because she now has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, her Savior. She is now one of God's children. She is now adopted into the family of God. Because she has trusted in Christ by faith. She has moved from relying on herself to relying solely on Christ alone for her salvation. 
The question where Jesus says, who is it that touched me is so important that I, I can't leave it alone. He says, who touched me? And he's not asking that question so that, so that someone could give him some knowledge. He's asking that question because in that moment, this woman had to turn around and face Jesus, face to face. And the significance of that is this, is Jesus Christ is not interested in a transactional relationship between you and me. He's not interested in you just coming to worship and checking the box, coming to worship and checking the box. He's interested in a personal relationship with you. One where you call him father and he calls you his son or daughter. And that personal relationship is so very important because there is one day when the Savior of the universe will pronounce those very words that he pronounced over the ruler's daughter. And he will say, child, arise. One day, there will be a resurrection. And one day he will say, child, arise. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. This woman declared what had happened to her and how Jesus had healed her. And in that moment, when she declares what happened to her, the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus himself, the father who has a dying daughter or a dead daughter, is actually in the hearing of her testimony. You and I need to share our testimony. We need to share how Jesus has worked in our lives because it encourages everyone in the body of Christ. He has heard his daughter is dead, and now he's hearing how Christ has saved this woman. We need to tell our stories. I'm going to end with the third stanza of that hymn that I started with, Jesus, I Come. It says this, out of rest and arrogant pride, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Out of myself to dwell in thy love, out of despair into raptures above, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into the joy and light of thy home, Jesus, I come to thee. Genuine saving faith involves us coming to Jesus, acknowledging that we're a sinner in need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, trusting in Christ alone through faith alone, and living out our new life. God has complete authority and power through Jesus Christ to transform your difficult circumstances, my difficult circumstances, into beautiful stories of redemption renewal, and reconciliation. And he is inviting you to come today to agree that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, to trust in Christ alone, and to live out the new life that he has for you. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.